Hey, Tom Altair here. I was talking to some clients today about our elimination diet and uh, they insisted that I do a blog post. <laughs> they said that I needed to communicate some things to people who are considering going on a gluten-free uh, diet or an elimination diet. And they said, hey, Tom, um, a couple of things. Number one, <laughs> what you should tell people is this is the thing to take them to the next level. This is the thing that's going to give them another lease on life. It will get their fatigue down, will get their energy up, will let that brain fog clear up, the pain will disappear. It is amazing. And you need to scare the bejeebies out of them. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean I need to scare the bejeebies out of them? They said, well, the reality is it's not easy, if you don't know what you're doing, to complete a gluten-free or elimination diet correctly. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how really 95 plus percent of the people who come into my clinical practice and they tell me, yes, I'm doing a gluten-free diet. Yes, I'm doing an elimination diet. I can find hidden sources of gluten. So who am I? Well, I'm Tom Altair, certified functional medicine practitioner. I'm actually an educator for the Institute for Functional Medicine. I have two science degrees from Bastyr University. And I've been doing this for over a decade now, actually 12 years in clinical practice. And I have a book called The Elimination Diet. And I made that book as a functional medicine practitioner because it is the foundation of functional medicine. If you want to get to the root of somebody's health conditions, you want to find out what's going on with arthritis or migraines or gallbladder disease, you need to look at what's irritating and what is nourishing a person. So you want to lower the irritants, you want to increase the nutrients, and there is nothing more potent than actually examining the diet. So diet is unique. You know, you can have foods like gluten and dairy that can irritate and at the same time they irritate, they cause people to actually lose nutrients, things like B12, folates, iron, magnesium. So it's this amazing balance that, you know, after uh, this person I talked to today, after 21 days, they woke up from chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia as well as having chronic migraines. So it's a, an amazingly powerful tool, but it's not that easy to succeed if you don't know what you're doing. So let's jump in. So I was traveling across the United States and Canada lecturing for a nutraceutical company. I was a nutrition educator. And as I was lecturing, um, I found this anomaly, okay? I used to eat a lot of canned lentils and I was bringing one of these canned lentils with me on travel. And I opened up the can and there was a wheat kernel in the can. I was like, oh, how, are, how are there grains in this lentil? This is really weird. And so as I was traveling, I went and I grabbed lentils from bulk bins. And as I was looking at these lentils in the bulk bins, I could get through like maybe a half cup, maybe a full cup at the max before I would see grains in there. And I was like, man, this is, this is quite unique here. What is, what is going on? So I shot this video. You can see on this video how I pour it in. I sift around like I'm mining for gold or something. And I actually find grains in these lentils. So I got to doing some examination of the data. I started talking to farmers. And sure enough, it turns out that a lot of times when you're growing crops, you do these cover crops. And these cover crops are often gluten containing. So they'll be wheat, they'll be rye, they'll be barley, whatnot. And what you'll do is then you'll plant your other crops, whether it's your lentils or your soybeans or something else. And what can happen is you can get this cross contamination. You grow the crop, they grow together, you put it in the same storage facility, you transport it in the same machinery, you take it to the same mill to actually mill the flour, and next thing you know, you have gluten cross-contamination. This isn't something, it's just me, Trisha Thompson, registered dietitian. She's published extensively on this. She basically says, look guys, this is a common practice in the United States. We see millet, we see sorghum, we see all sorts of things, up to 32% of samples that are supposedly gluten-free grains may have gluten cross-contamination. Here's the millet, the buckwheat, the sorghum, you can see it here. And then Canada, it's coming out and saying, look, at least 9.5% of our samples of the flour products are actually contaminated. And here's Trisha Thompson again, New England Journal of Medicine of all things. And she's saying, you rarely, rarely get gluten-free oats, whether it's a Irish steel cut oats, old fashioned oats, Quaker oats, you're gonna oftentimes have cross-contamination. So are you thinking about this? Are you thinking, look, yeah, I'm gonna go on a gluten-free diet and I'm gonna do a lot of rice and oats and all sorts of things, and I'm not being conscious of where my rice flour is coming from or where my oats are coming from. Because the reality is, if you do long-term 
follow-up of people who are on gluten-free diets like celiacs who've been diagnosed with a condition. They find that a lack of adherence to a strict gluten-free diet is the main reason for poorly controlled disease. And that can be intentional or unintentional. The reality is a lot of people excuse it away. You know, they'll say like, hey, yeah, you know, I can take one bite of a muffin. It's no big deal. Or I'm not celiac. Maybe I'm just gluten sensitive. Nonsense. The reality, I've, I've had conversations since 2004 with gastroenterologists and recently with uh, Dr. Alessio Fasano when I was working the Autism Research Institute Scientific Roundtable with him. And I said, hey, you know, Dr. Fasano, I was told in 2004 by a GI doc, he said, 100% effort equals 100% results. If you don't get rid of all the gluten in your diet, every little last little fragment, you're not going to find the results. I said, what do you think about that? And he says, Tom, 99% effort equals zero results. You've got to get it all out. I was like, wow, this guy is like the world expert in gluten sensitivity. So where could it be? Well, this is New England Journal of Medicine, once again, 2007, showing rice, corn, millet, sorghum, teff, oats, arrowroot, tapioca, lentils. These are all supposedly free-to-eat gluten-free foods. Oh, they're fine. Go ahead and eat them. This is the fundamentals of a gluten-free diet. Well, what I've seen from clinical practice... So many people are getting rice flour that is produced in a cross-contaminated facility. So many people are getting corn with the same thing, millet, sorghum. Teff, interestingly enough, isn't usually cross-contaminated. However, the little teff grain, if eaten as a porridge, can actually cause intestinal upset in some people. Oats, as we just saw. Now, here's a doozer, arrowroot and tapioca. If you get cakes, cookies, pastas, if you get... Anything that's cooked with a refined flour, where's that refined flour coming from? When I called manufacturers of arrowroot and tapioca and I said, hey guys, you know, well, what do you primarily grain, you know, grind here? And they said, well, spelt. That's our primary grain. We do wheat, we do spelt. And, uh, you know, we just happen to also do this tapioca and arrowroot. And I was like, well, what do you do in between? Well, we just wipe stuff out and no big deal. And I was like, no, come on, you know. You know, you're going to have the flour in the air. You're going to have all these issues. So the reality is many people are thinking they're going on a gluten-free diet and they're not. So am I being neurotic? Am I being over uh, cautious? And no, my clients teach this to me all the time. I have a client who, I have two clients um, that, uh, you know, have such sensitivities that if they get a little bit of dust on their coffee cup, if they have a little bit of exposure in their kitchen, it's enough to put them back into their irritable bowel, or in one case, chronic fatigue. So it's quite common that little bits go a long way. And why not, right? We have these immune cells that are meant to react with bacterium. And when we give them a large chunk of a muffin, of course they're going to react. But if we also give them a teeny little bit of this invader, they can also react to that. How little, you ask? Look at this one. This is fantastic. This is New England Journal of Medicine, June 2007. And what they're saying is, they have two people diagnosed celiacs. They put them on a gluten-free diet. They follow them around. They're like, wait a second, their symptoms are not getting better. What is going on? They're not eating anything in their life that has gluten in it. Well, they said, wow, well, let's pull like a house. Let's follow them during their typical day and let's see what they're doing. And what they did was they put gluten-containing animal feed into a trough in an enclosed room. And the dust, the dust... 150 grams of gluten-containing dust particles per day was getting up in the air. They were inhaling it, swallowing it, and it was causing their reactions to continue. This is me. This is New England Journal of Medicine here. All they did was put a dust mask on these people and their symptoms of fatigue, bloating, lower abdominal cramps in patient one, and abdominal cramps, daily diarrhea, fatigue, and weight loss in two went away. And I have to challenge you folks, if you're going to say, well, this is just celiac people. I'm not celiac. I don't even know. Maybe I'm gluten sensitive or whatever. Some of the worst reactions I see from gluten come from people who test negative for the genes. People who do not test positive for TTG and anti-endometrial antibodies. People who you would never guess would have issues. They've had biopsies, for goodness sakes, negative biopsies. And they have fulminant issues, whether it's brain problems. I have one person whose right side of their face goes numb every time they eat gluten. And all the tests turn out negative. It's like, well, how can you ignore that, right? 
So the reality is there's a lot more going on. We need to be conscious of it. Could be that you're getting cross-contaminated from the air. Now I had two example of uh, bakers that I was seeing as clients. Both of them were on complete gluten-free diets and yet they continue to have gluten associated symptomology because they were breathing in the flour. Now, all you have to do is look in the literature for like 10 minutes and you'll see Baker's asthma and all these responsive diseases from inhaling flour. So it's a real issue that you need to be cautious of. And it's not just me. Dr. Albert Rowe, he wrote a book called The Elimination Diet. And this is an article published by him in 1938. 1938. Listen to this. During such visits, the physician must be certain that the patient is adhering to his diet. Possible mistakes in the kitchen, such as the stirring of the patient's food with a spoon that has touched milk soup or egg, if they are excluded from the diet, should be prevented. Canned soups often contain unrecognized foods not included in the patient's diet. Look at this. The possibility that so-called pure flours may be mixed with wheat or other ingredients must be appreciated. Now, it's not just wheat here, but there's the reference to wheat. It is especially hazardous to entrust the making of bakery products to an ordinary baker in an unsupervised shop. Listen to this. Since the temptation to include wheat or other forbidden food against orders is often too much to resist. Above all else, the patient himself is apt to taste a little food off the diet or to take an interdicted food thinking a little will do no harm. Careful inquiry of the various foods eaten in friends' homes, restaurants, or hotels will often reveal light of def or definite mistakes. This is it. This is the reality. Eating out is almost impossible. Let me let me tell you a couple of stories. I was in New Orleans, of all things, and I, I got a side of broccoli because it was like the only thing I had to eat at this restaurant with my buddy. And, uh, you know, we were at a medical conference. And so we're sitting down, and this doctor and I, and I looked down at my broccoli, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, turn over my broccoli. And on the bottom of the broccoli was a macaroni noodle. I was like, how is that being possible? It's like, call over the waiter. I'm like, hey, what's going on? He's like, oh, well, here's what happens. We use the macaroni scoop to scoop out your broccoli from the dish next to it. And I was like, ah, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm celiac. I can't do this. You know, what are you doing? And then another one, I was eating at a restaurant and I had a curry. And it was a coconut curry and it was supposed to be gluten-free. It said gluten-free on the menu. Same kind of thing happened. I look in there and there's a little wheat kernel. It was actually farro. And I call over the waiter. I was like, what's going on? And so they go and they look and they say, well, well, someone was scooping the farro over your dish when it was sitting on the counter. It must have dropped in. So the reality, eating out is tough, right? Even if you try and go totally gluten-free on the ingredients, there's possibility of some cross-contamination in preparation. How do I know this? Well, Allie and I flew down to an autism conference in Atlanta, and uh, we were given the task to prepare food for over 400 clinicians, parents, and autistic children. And when we got called into the kitchen, you know, we go and we look at all the dishes in the kitchen and they were baking pie crusts and they were doing biscuits and they were doing all sorts of stuff in this, this hotel kitchen. And would, wouldn't you believe, like we go and try and use the dishes and we're looking and we're like, what is all this white stuff stuck on the edges and on, on, the, on the spoons, the wooden spoons and on the cutting boards? What is this stuff? And they were like, oh, well, this is our flour. We use this, you know, really fine um, uh, dough flour. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. It was everywhere. It took us an hour just to rewash the dishes so we didn't have these flour residues in the hotel dishes. So I want you to really be conscious of the fact that uh, you need the bejeebies scared at you, <laughs> according to my client. You need to really be aware that there are hidden sources. And it may be in your medications. It may be in some of the supplements you're taking. I had a vitamin D that was a chewable supplement that had, it wasn't listed on the label, it had gluten in it. So you need to be conscious, like you need to be a real good investigator. And if it's tough for you to find all these things, then please find help. You know, whether it's from me and my elimination diet book or our online elimination diet program. You know, we've been doing this over 12 years now. We found a lot of hidden sources. We know where to look for things. You know what to do so you can succeed. But the reality is it doesn't matter where you get it from. I really want you to find that next level. I want you to find where you don't have brain fog. You don't have joint pain. You don't have intestinal upset. You don't have skin issues. And to be honest with you, the biggest thing, I think it'd be agreed upon by all functional medicine practitioners, the biggest thing is to examine the food you're eating. Try an elimination diet, but make sure you do it correctly because I want you to have the success. I don't want you to do something, spend all the time and energy and not get the results you deserve. 
So wishing you the best of possible luck. I hope this has served you and I hope you find optimal health. Take care.